I am uh, Ivo and I am a designer at Luminous. Now, I have been designing digital products since 1998, so it has been 20 years already and oh my god, time does really fly. And I do not want to sound senile or pathetic or overly dramatic, but there are days that I feel that we've only just begun. You know, I don't know if you were listening to the song by the Carpenters just now before I started talking, but that's exactly how I feel sometimes, that we've only just begun. And that's because over the past 20 years, the world, and especially the world of technology, and in particular, um, our professions as IT specialists have changed and evolved so dramatically and rapidly that every day, literally every day, there have been new things to learn and scores of new things to explore. So in a way, every day, I felt a little bit like a beginner again. I do not know if that sounds familiar to any of you, but I, um, I guess it does. So I work at, at Luminous, which is a company that designs, I'm a designer that designs, develops and implements uh, all kinds of digital solutions for a broad range of clients, both in the Netherlands and abroad. And I, I feel very privileged to work with a group of very talented people that have all kinds of different backgrounds. I work alongside software architects and engineers, of course, but also with business analysts, strategists, writers, data scientists, you name it. And this diversity in people has created for me a very diverse environment that really helped me to keep up with the pace in, in which things are changing in our profession. So if you want to know more about Luminous or the projects that we do, please step by our booth. We're right outside here. I really think you should do that, by the way. But I'm not here today to promote Luminous. I'm here to tell you all a story that, to be honest, nobody likes to hear. And that is the story about how tools and methods are killing your products. Now, tools and methods have been two of these th things that have been evolving and changing so very rapidly over the past 20 years. But if you ask me whether all this change actually brought us better products, then I would have to say, yes, definitely. Compared to 20 years ago, I believe that we create a lot more digital products, and these products are a lot smarter than they were before. And we do so, we create these products in a more reliable and manageable and sustainable way. So a big hooray for our tools and methods because they absolutely, definitely helped us to achieve all this. I really believe so. So now you might be wondering why I'm still claiming that these same tools and methods are also killing our products. Well, over the recent years, I have experienced that some, some recurring and damaging patterns in the way companies and, um, and, and individuals use and, and implement these tools and, and methods. And that really gets me frustrated, the way how some people and companies put all their trust into a single tool or a single method. And it really frust frustrates me to see how many time and effort some companies put into optimizing processes instead of products. And how sometimes individuals can hide behind methods or hide inside tooling, especially when things go wrong. So I really think that tools and methods are only as good as the people uh, that are using them. There are no silver bullets. So today I want to share four of the uh, uh, most common symptoms that I've seen of product teams and individuals that have gone astray 
and I will also share my thoughts on how I think you could prevent or fix these symptoms. By the way, I do not claim to have all the answers, but I do claim that these are real problems, and I do believe that everyone needs to be aware of them, and everyone needs to think about how to prevent them. So these are the four symptoms that I uh, want to talk about today. It's the scrum pendulum, Jira's hammer, the swamp of continuous delivery, it's a good one, and if time permits, and I think so, I will also cover the prototype Mirage. Now, on a side note, a few weeks back, I gave this same presentation at another tech conference, and after I was finished, I looked around the audience, and I noticed that some of the people were looking very displeased, and some angry even, or annoyed. So I, I, I uh, went to a colleague who was also present there, and I asked him whether or not I had given a bad presentation. I said, he's a very nice guy, so he said, no, not a bad presentation per se, but it is, your story is kind of hard to swallow. So we talked about this a little bit more, and some others joined in, and we concluded that that's because the story is in fact, in the end, about taking responsibility over things uh, that you do not always fully control. And I have to admit, that can be kind of scared. But I do think it's important that we all take this responsibility. But before I go into the really nasty stuff, let me take you back on a small trip down memory lane. When I was 16 years old, when I was 16 years old, I did not want to become a designer. I wanted to, to become uh, an artist. I had discovered this natural talent for drawing and painting, and I was really into the visual arts. But most importantly, I wanted to become the opposite of my own father, who was at that time a software systems designer at some large company in the Netherlands. And I thought he had the most boring job imaginable because I was 16 and he was my father. So I. I decided to go another route, so I went to art school. And to make a long story short and boring, in the end, I did not make it as an artist. Despite all technique and all skill I had acquired, and the fact that I could now basically create anything I could imagine, I just could not imagine enough. So I ended up being a designer, just like my dad after all, and it turned out to be a pretty amazing job so I'm glad things turned out this way. So today I design digital products, and most of the time I do that as a part of multidisciplinary development teams. You know them, you're probably also part of these kind of teams. Being part of these teams learned me that advanced tooling and so-called proven development methods are no guarantee for a successful product. Just like back in art school, my skill and technique were no guarantee to become an artist. In product, product development, I've learned, in product development, these tools and methods can even hurt your product because they can distract you, you and your team from what you should really be focusing on, the end result, the product, and not the process. Which is exactly what happened when I first became part of my first Scrum team some 15 years ago. I was working in a company that had just recently implemented Scrum as their new development method. And although most people were, were well aware of what this meant for them, uh, they knew what was expected from them, most of them were more involved into running the process right than into building the right product. Does that sound familiar? I guess it does. Um, because I have seen it on more than just a single occasion. I've seen that later on many times at all kinds of companies. So it's, I think it's worth taking a closer look at. I call this symptom the scrum pendulum. 
When I think about product development and Scrum, I think about two things. I think about the product, obviously, and I think about the team that develops the product. Now, these two live in completely different worlds. The world of the product is ruled by business goals and user goals, while the world of the team in Scrum is ruled by sprint goals. These are not the same kind of goals. For instance, a sprint goal could be to implement authentication in one way or the other. That would never be a business or a user goal. Of course, it contributes, probably contri contributes to business and user goals, but in itself it's not a business or user goal. These are not the same kind of goals. They're defined at different levels. So in Scrum, the team works in short iterations called sprints. We all know that, right? And with these sprints, the team develops the product in small steps, which minimizes risk and maximizes agility. Hooray, that's great. That's great about Scrum. But there are pitfalls. So the whole process goes a little bit like this. During a sprint, the team develops some new feature or functionality that's then been released to the product and that triggers some kind of response. And that response is then potentially translated back into new product requirements that are fed back to the development team. And this movement, this goes on and on, sprint after sprint after sprint. And what I've often seen is that during all this, the development team gets somewhat trapped inside their sprint bubble. They're lulled to sleep by the scrum pendulum, the constant rhythm of the sprints, the hyper focus on the sprint goal. They're actually unaware of what their work is doing to the product. They're unaware of what this product is doing to the user and the business. In these cases, the only link between the team and the product is the PO, the product owner. He or she has a pretty important, a pretty crucial role in all this because he or she is responsible for translating user and business goals into product requirements. And he or she is also the one who should decide whether or not new functionality is fit to be released to the product. So you can imagine that if this product owner, this PO, fails to do a good job, then the whole process fails. So you could also see this PO as a SBOF, a single point of failure. And that is something my dad, my own dad, as being a software designer, he, had, he told me, that's something you need to avoid in complex and important systems like this. So to prevent things from going wrong because of such a detached development team or because of failing product owners, I believe that the development team itself should step outside the sprint bubble at least once in a while. They too should take responsibility over the product's success. And this is just one example on how you could achieve that. There are countless others, but I believe that teams should define what success means for them as professionals, as a team of professionals. So depending on their role inside the team, they might have different opinions on that. I know that designers think other things are important in products than engineers or testers or whatever. And that's exactly the point. That's exactly why you should talk about these things to create some common understanding among, among your team members of what you as a team think success means to you. When are we successful? It's more or less a definition of success, not a definition of done, which we all know in, s in Scrum. A defini a definition of done is about work you do inside your sprint bubble. A definition of success is about what it does at the other side, on the product side. For example, part of a team's definition of success could be some minimum rating of four stars in an app store if it's an app you are developing, or um, it could be a reduction of your support calls, um, which might be a little bit harder to measure, but both are still very doable for a team to measure 
for themselves. The important part, of course, is that every once in a while, the team should check whether the, the product lives up to their own expectations to, uh, expectations, to their own standards in the real world, the product world on that side. And again, some things might be harder to evaluate than other things, but there's a lot a team can do for itself with a minimum effort. You do not need 100% accurate data. Some quick and dirty research can give you and your team a lot of valuable input, and a lot of valuable information. And this information will help you and your team to get a lot better and a deeper understanding of the consequences of the choices you have made in your sprint bubble. So this way you create this kind of outer loop which prevents the scrum pendulum by establishing a team commitment to the product beside the sprint commitment. Both are important, but you need both. And as a bonus, it also serves as a backup for when the product owner fails. And believe me, that does occur. They are out there, product owners that fail. They are very real. So this is just one example uh, that I've experienced uh, works well to prevent the scrum pendulum. There are countless others probably. Uh, I'm really like to hear uh, what your experience with this kind of optimizations is. The important thing to remember is that you should never let a method like Scrum or any other method replace your own or your team's commitment to create the best product possible. It is about taking that responsibility as an individual, as a, as a pro professional and as a team, even if that's not an explicit part of your job description. So, but even if you have your team committed to both the product and the process, things can still go wrong. I talk a little bit like I design with a lot of white space, so sorry about that. So let's take a look at a tool that's very common, commonly used in product development, issue management tooling. Now I've called this symptom Jira's hammer. I guess most of you know Jira, but it's actually not about Jira. It's about issue management tooling in general, but issue management tooling in general's hammer just didn't sound snappy. So I called it Jira's hammer. And again, the issue with this tooling is not about the tooling itself. It's about the way how some individuals tend to use it. So here we go. Products, physical products, digital products, no matter what products, they do not magically appear out of nowhere. Right? They always start with a product vision. What's a product vision? A product vision is a beautiful but somewhat sketchy concept of what the product should or could be like, right? Now, you cannot hand over such a sketchy concept to a development team and ask them to build it. It just doesn't work that way. They wouldn't know what to do with it. It's just too big, too sketchy. So this is what usually happens with these beautiful concepts. The beautiful vision gets smashed up in smaller parts. That's because smaller parts are easier to define and easier to assign to a development team. And all parts together, of course, are supposed to make the whole product as was envisioned. So the parts end up as prioritized tasks in a system like Jira, uh, and that helps to plan and track the work on these issues, which is important and great to keep the development man manage, uh, manageable. So this is what happens in, in practice. Developer A picks up, developer A picks up the first part from Jira or any other tool um, and starts developing it. Well, it was very well described, very well documented, so the developer knows exactly what to build. And here it is, the first part of the product. A new product is born, a perfect letter I. Next, developer B picks up the next part from the backlog and also starts developing it. It's also perfectly executed and integrated in the in, in, in the best way these developers thought possible. And this goes on and on. 
The team continues to pick up and deliver work as defined, and the product starts to grow. Something beautiful is starting to take form here, as you can see, and it keeps growing into something that developers think the product should be like. So now you probably start to see my point also. You could also make other things out of these parts, or, well, maybe not anything, but a lot of things. You could make a lot of things out of these parts, like, for instance, this product. It's finished. And it looks nice, doesn't it? it? It even somewhat resembles the original product vision, or doesn't it? Well, no. It does not really, not really, a little bit maybe, but it might look pretty much the same on the surface, but the inner workings, the subtle inner workings are very different. And that this product was made up by the same parts that as the original vision, but it does not reflect the original product vision because the development team was never included in this vision. They only had this des description of the separate parts. They had no idea of the original product vision. Had no idea of the context of the parts that they were building. So, what I believe you should do instead when using tools like Jira is not, not only to define the parts, but also the context of each part. So instead of just defining the parts in Jira, context of each part should, should also be included. Explain the role of each part inside the product. So what does that mean? You could, for instance, and that's very easy to do, wrap your descriptions up in real world user stories. So don't say, as a client, I need to authenticate so the system knows who I am, but instead, use as a client, I need to authenticate so I can quickly and effortlessly get the coffee the way I like it. For instance, if that's an app you're developing. If you are improving on a product based on some user research, for instance, happens a lot, then please include the research findings in your JIRA issue. Do not only include the design of the solution in your JIRA issue. Your development team should also know what the problem is they are trying to solve. So include the research finding in JIRA. And if possible, add design impressions of the future product. How will your product look like in one, two, three years from now? Your development team should have an idea of that. So we can all work towards that single goal and do not have different visions of the dot on the, on the horizon. So this way the team will understand what it is they are trying to accomplish. In the context of the product, instead of only having the narrow understanding of the issue at hand, it does not even matter how you do it, if you ask me. I don't care how you do it. If you are the one that's responsible for describing what a development team should build, then I believe you're also responsible for making sure they understand the bigger picture. So let's say that th your team is committed to both the product and the process. They know and understand your product vision they even support it, they like it, they love it. Then there's still a lot of things that might go wrong with tools and methods. We're not there yet. For instance, with the development of automated testing and delivery tooling came something that was called continuous delivery. Instead of re uh, releasing your product peri periodically, we are now able to deliver every little increment as a new product, as a new version. Because the overhead in time and resources for testing and delivering has been dramatically reduced, right? And that's awesome. My colleagues keep telling me that it's awesome, this continuous delivery. So this symptom is called the swamp of continuous delivery because I have seen on several occasions individuals or companies getting lost 
are sucked into this continuous delivery process and sometimes with dramatic results. But let's first take a look at this very nice picture. Do you, do you know this game? I think most of us I, I have, I have played this game. Um, it was very popular when, when I was a, a kid, so it's pretty old. And it's a really fun game, as you can see by the face of uh, the father, I assume. It's really a fun game. The, the aim of the game is to, to, to transport the coins from the bottom slot to the bottom tray here by turning these wheels. It's really simple, but if I turn my wheel, the wheel on the other side will also be turned, so that's kind of annoying, and that makes up a great game, right? Annoying each other. That's what uh, the basics of a great game is. So why am I showing you this? It's because, for me, um, this game resembles how product development uh, works. You insert an issue at the top, a feature or functionality, that gets picked up and handed over between the different expertises and is then released at the bottom to the product. So let's look a bit closer at how this works. Let's say this single wheel is your development team. So we have a game with just one wheel. That's not really a fun game, but it's just an example, right? Um, an issue gets inserted at the top. The team processes it into a new feature, and then that feature is released to the product. Hooray, it works. But with continuous delivery, this is not a single issue, but a constant stream of issues being picked up, processed, and then released to the product. Now notice how this wheel runs at a constant speed. Notice how all slots always get filled. And also notice how all the issues always get released in time. It's a constant, sustainable, and reliable stream of awesomeness to the product. That's what continuous delivery is. It's awesome. My colleagues are right. Just look at the competition. It's, it's sad, really. Here at the left, we have Waterfall, um, in which the whole product is developed as a monolith that's then, after it's finished, being released at in, in a big bang, a single big bang release, after, after which you, most of the time, find out that this was not what the business intended or the users we're waiting for, right? So then in the middle, we have Scrum, a lot better already, in which small sets of issues are being developed in short sprints, after which they get released to the product. Things might still go wrong sometimes, but the damage is m more contained, right? It's more manageable. It becomes a manageable process. And on the right, there's continuous delivery. Every issue, their single is a single version, it's a release in itself. The product is constantly evolving in the smallest of steps. So how much more agile can you get? <laughs> what could ever go wrong with this scenario, you might ask? Now, well, like I already mentioned, product development is not a single wheel. There are multiple expertises working together. So with continuous delivery, you have to imagine these wheels all running in perfect sync with the maximum of slots always used to create a maximum throughput. So here it is, a constant, sustainable, and reliable stream of awesomeness. It almost sounds too good to be true, and it sometimes is, really, it, it is. In this animation, all wheels run in perfect sync, but in the real world, these wheels consist of real people, right? With real lives, going to real parties, drinking, real beers, for instance, to get really drunk and to, to get up really early in the morning to get to their real jobs. Well, if you're anything like me, then you'll know that these wheels in practice won't always run in sync. So now imagine what happens when the wheels start running out of sync. For instance, the product owner cannot deliver the first wheel at the top as the product owner. Imagine that his wheel starts to run slow. So either the development team slots start remaining empty or issues get handed over to the development team prematurely before the product owner has finished them. And that last thing is something that you see pretty often. 
that the development team receives issues from product management or product owner before they are finished, before they can actually start working on it. And that's one major thing that can go wrong, issues being handed over prematurely because it causes ambiguity. And in the end, the wrong, the wrong things will get built. So to keep delivering quality without wasting your resources, you, of course, need to keep these wheels running in sync as much as possible, which means that starts by balancing your resources right. But more importantly, on a more daily basis, I believe that you should never let the process pressure you too much to hand over your issues prematurely. Because in the end, the wrong things will get built. And another thing that often goes wrong, well, it does not really go wrong, but uh, it is that companies do not fully benefit from this process. So even when you have things running smooth, smoothly, smooth, smooth, smoothly, smoothly, even when you have things running smoothly, some companies only think in this direction, inside out. And if you only think this way, why would you need to be agile anyway? Because to fully benefit from continuous delivery or agile in general, there should also be a constant stream going the other direction, outside in. You are not delivering features to get them off your backlog, right? You are trying to solve a problem for your customer. You are trying to add value uh, for your business. So after deployment, make sure you measure if it did solve the problem. And if it didn't, be prepared to try again. There's no point in being agile if you're not open from, for feedback from your customers. So um, up until now, I have been covering uh, these symptoms that were more or less about uh, product development in general, which might uh, give the impression that I'm only pointing to others, uh, claiming that they should better their lives and that designers are all perfect. Um, to prevent that uh, impression, I've also included a design-specific symptom, and that's the prototype mirage. Um, as a designer, I really love prototyping. It's an important tool for me. But there are many things that can go wrong with prototypes, and I believe that also developers should be aware of these dangers. But let, let's start why I love prototyping. Um, let's say this customer wants to get me uh, to, to, to design a solution for, for him that gets him from A to B. Uh, it's just an example, right? They never ask me that, but as an example. And I will ask them some obvious questions, like what's the distance between A to B, and what's your budget, what's the amount of people traveling, etc. And then I can think of ways to solve this problem. And I could tell him, I have this idea for a craft that can get passengers from A to B. But if I show him a prototype of my idea, then my client might realize that this craft actually floats on water, and he's afraid of water. So we both learn about this new relevant requirement for the product that we both hadn't thought about before. So prototypes reveal the question that you should have asked, and words just don't do it that efficiently as prototypes. But there's more. Uh, words can cause ambiguity. Um, you, you might all think, when talking about some kind of solution or a design, that you all um, agree on, on, on the idea or on the design, but you might all be talking about something different. If I show them a prototype instead of using words, everybody is sure, surely on the same page. So there's less room for personal interpretation with a prototype, which makes the conversations a lot more effective. But, my dear friends, prototypes can also be false promises. Most of the time when I design a product, the team, the technology, the budget of this solution is already fixed before I start designing. So I might come up with some perfect solution and that will convince everybody because it's a beautiful prototype. And if the team cannot develop it within the budget, it will never become the solution that I've promised my client, right? It is the designer's responsibility to keep things real 
and to know the team's abilities and limitations. And the technological context, the budget, and the relevance of the solution you are designing. So let's look a little closer to the relevance of the solution you are designing. During the process, and designers will, will, will know what I'm talking about, during the process of de de designing a prototype, it's very tempting to cut some reality corners just to create the most beautiful and powerful solution that you can imagine. Because you can, it's a prototype, it's not a real product yet. So the proposed solution might work, and it's also bound to trigger a lot of enthusiasm, but the question remains, is it the right solution and is it realistic? For instance, the A to B example again. If A is Amsterdam and B is Beijing, it might be a good idea to, to build uh, a plane for that. But if A is Antwerp and B is Brussels, then yes, you could do that by plane, but there are probably better solutions for that. A fancy prototype might get people excited anyway, but often a plain and simple solution is better. Sure, it pleases designers like me when other people love their work, and that's the dangerous part, part of my work. If everybody falls in love with a prototype of me, that's, and it, it's the first solution that they see, other alternatives are often not even given a chance, even if they are better. That's just how a lot of people work. It's hard for people to con consider alternatives if, if they have already seen a good solution. It's even harder to consider alternative, uh, alternatives if they've also found that first solution to be very beautiful. It's the designer's responsibility to take that into account. First prototype a concept, or a few concepts is even better, before making things visually appealing and lovable, to prevent people from falling in love with a solution too soon. So we've reached the end of this presentation. Uh, I hope that my story, or at least parts of it, has resonated with some of you, and that it will help you to keep the right focus in your work. Um, and that's the focus on the product, by the way, not the process. Um, we have one and a half minute left for some questions, so this is your cue. Okay, no questions? Then let's all grab a beer then. Thank you very much.